uh, and I'm just in the chair for this uh, demo. Um, demo is a, a type of meeting which is uh, intended to give a, a, an introduction to the topic of the discussion paper, which will come later on. Um, this meeting is being recorded, uh, so just to be aware that uh, anything uh, you contribute will be part of that recording. Um, we're particularly grateful to the authors of the paper this time, uh, some of the authors, for contributing some presentations uh, to form part of this uh, demo. Uh, and we'll have uh, Paul Fernhead first from the University of Lancaster and then Murray Pollock afterwards from the University of Newcastle. Um, they're going to talk uh, for uh, separately about different pieces. So we'll have about half an hour first with Paul uh, and then we can take some questions. Uh, I'd quite like you to write your questions or a, um, at least a, an indication that you'd like to ask a question using the chat, which is uh, a little bubble in the menu bar along your screen at the bottom uh, with some text bits in that shows you the chat and you can type where it says type a new message. Um, so if you put something there, then I'll try to handle the questions at the end. Uh, and then um, after Murray's presentation, we'll, we'll have a, a similar process of doing those things. Um, I guess you all sorted this, but uh, if you could keep your video off and your microphone muted, uh, unless you're actually talking, um, that would be great, please, so that we don't get too much feedback. Uh, I'll leave my own picture on the screen while the presentations are happening, but I'll mute myself while that's going on, um, just, just so the speakers have somebody to look at rather than uh, just talking to themselves. Um, in that case, I think without further ado, we'll uh, ask Paul to share his screen and kick off with the first part of the presentation. OK, so hopefully um, you can see the screen with my slides. Um, in which case, um, we can. welcome to this, this, this pre-meeting um, talk about this paper on quasi-stationary Monte Carlo and the scale algorithm. Um, what we're hoping to cover in this, this talk now is just to try and give a bit of the background and intuition behind some of the key ideas that appear in the paper. And as has been mentioned, um, it's going to be a talk of two halves. So I'll be giving the first talk and Mary Pollock will, will be giving the second half of the talk. So an overview um, is, is as follows. So, so essentially, the, the, the sort of two key ideas which are quite central to the, the scale paper is an idea of, of quasi-stationarity and an idea of the sort of, of diffusions and the, the sort of challenges of, of simulating exactly um, from diffusions. And they're going to form the sort of two halves of, of um, this talk with me covering the sort of quasi-stationarity aspects. What is quasi-stationarity? How would you simulate from a quasi-stationary distribution? And then maybe talking about diffusions. But I thought I, it would be good just to start with one slide of sort of motivation, both behind the, the scale paper itself and um, to help sort of motivate the topics that, that we're going to be covering in this talk. So the, the motivation for the scale paper was to try and come up with an alternative um, to MCMC. So hopefully you're all familiar with MCMC. MCMC is in many ways the sort of workhorse of Bayesian statistics. And the idea of MCMC is that you can construct a Markov chain whose stationary distribution pi of x is the posterior distribution that you want to sample from. And then by simulating that Markov chain a long time um, and using the fact that if you simulate the, the Markov chain for sufficiently longer time, it will have converged to stationarity, um, you can get samples from the posterior. Okay, And the, the general idea of that is you have a guess as to how long it takes to converge to stationarity. Um, you run your chain. Um, you know, you discard the first part which, where you don't think it's converged to stationarity as burn in, and you keep the, the samples after that that point uh, as being samples from the posterior. Okay. And the idea of scale is to do something very similar, but instead of trying to simulate a Markov process whose stationary distribution 
high is the posterior, we're going to try and construct and simulate a Markov process whose quasi-stationary distribution, which I'm going to denote by, by nu of x, is a posterior. Okay, And it turns out that, that in terms of being able to construct a process whose quasi-stationary distribution is the, post, the specific posterior you want to sample from, it's helpful to work with um, diffusions with killing. Okay. But essentially, the, the, the sort of, I guess the, the thing I want to get across is, is that the, what we're sort of doing is, is something similar to MCMC, but rather than trying to simulate from a stationary distribution of a marker process, we, we're going to try and simulate from a, a quasi stationary distribution of, of a marker process. Okay. So that naturally leads to the question as to what is a, a quasi stationary distribution. And so quasi stationary distributions occur when you have. Markov processes which have an absorbing state. And in terms of this talk, I'm going to call the absorbing state F. So, so I'm going to imagine a process, a Markov process, which evolves over time. But at each time step, there's going to be some probability that the process dies. And, and in practice, that probability will depend on the actual state of the process at that, at that time point. OK? And if you were thinking about describing the long-term behavior of such a process, this idea of a stationary distribution that, that we're familiar with isn't actually very helpful because for most of these processes, if you run it for long enough, the process will die. So the sort of long-term behavior is that with probability tending to one, um, the process will be dead. So this has, has led to a different idea, this idea of quasi-stationary distribution in order to try and describe the sort of interesting long-term behavior. And the idea of the quasi-stationary distribution is that we're looking at the limiting distribution of the process conditional on it being alive. So what's the long-term distribution of the process given that it's still alive a long time in the future? And we can sort of make that a little bit more precise. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to let X of T be our Markov process. Um, and as I said, um, so th th this will be a bit like a Markov process, except that it will have this extra property that um, with some probability that depends on position, the process will die at each iteration. Okay. And then we can introduce a distribution nu T of X um, to be the, the sort of density of the state at time T conditional on the process still being alive. And then the idea of the quasi-stationary distribution is it's just going to be the limit as t goes to infinity of, of this distribution nu t of x, okay, assuming that, that such a, a limit exists. Okay. So that's what a quasi-stationary distribution is. And the main sort of computational algorithmic challenge in the scale algorithm is actually in terms of how do we actually construct an efficient way of simulating from the quasi station distribution of a certain um, Markov process. Okay. What I sort of, what, I, what I'm skipping over um, with that is how would you actually construct a Markov process, which in such a way that it will have as it's quasi stationary distribution, a distribution that you want to sample from. But it sort of turns out that if you're working with a Brownian motion process with, a, with killing, then there's actually quite a sim simple relationship between the sort of killing rate you would need and the posterior distribution you'd want to simulate from in order for that Brownian motion with killing to have the, have the posterior as its quasi stationary distribution. Okay, and, and the details of that are actually in the paper. What I want to focus on here is just think about some of the challenges, you know, assuming that, that we're giving a, a marker process with killing that we and we want to simulate from its, its quasi stationary distribution, how would we actually do that? Okay. And as I've mentioned, the scale algorithm itself is based on trying to simulate from the quasi stationary distribution of a, a diffusion process with killing. Okay. Now, actually, sim just simulating exactly a diffusion process with killing is itself itself introduces some sort of challenges. 
so to try and sort of simplify the situation and, and give some intuition around quasi stationarity and some of the challenges specific just to simulating from a quasi stationary distribution itself, I'm just going to focus on the most simpler case of trying to um, simulate from the quasi stationary distribution of a discrete time marker process. Okay, and hopefully, if you get some of the intuition for how we do this, then the sort of jump to the scale algorithm where we're then working with, with diffusions um, won't be quite so um, impenetrable. So if we were if we're going to so we're going to work with this sort of discrete time markup process with killing and in order to define um, such a process we actually have to specify sort of three things one of which is the sort of the initial distribution of the process the other is the transition density, so the, what's the probability density if we're currently in state Y of moving to state X, okay? And hopefully you'll recognize that they're the two things you'd have to specify to, to define a standard Markov process. And then the third thing you need to do for, for a Markov process with killing is to, is to specify the probability that the process dies at any iteration. Okay, so we need to also specify a killing probability k of x, which would be the probability at any iteration that the process would die if it's currently in state x. Okay. So, so let's imagine we've been given a discrete time marker process with killing. So, so we've been told what these three components of our process is. How would we go about simulating from its quasi station distribution, okay? And it turns out that we're not going to directly simulate from the quasi station distribution. We're gonna use the same sort of idea that is used in sort of MCMC of what we really want, you know, quasi stationarity describes the long-term behavior of the process. So we'll think about simulating our process for a, a sufficiently long time, through some burn-in and then forget things we throw away stuff that happened prior to the sort of burn in and keep things that have happened after the burn in. Okay. And so, one way of thinking about this is that we've introduced these, de these densities nu t, which is the conditional density of our process at time t, given that it's alive at time t. And these densities converge to the, to the quasi stationary distribution. So, what we're going to imagine is that we've come up with some burn in time capital T that's that at time capital T and later, we think um, this density nu T is sufficiently co close to the quasi stationary distribution. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to try and simulate from nu T for T is one, T is two, et cetera. And then we're just gonna keep the samples that we get from these densities at time capital T or later as samples from the quasi stationary distribution, okay? So, what, what, so the, the sort of idea of using this sort of burning idea is that we can simplify the problem of sampling from the quasi stationary distribution just to how do we simulate from these densities new T for different varieties of T. Okay. So the, the simplest way um, of actually doing this is just by a forward simulation of the Markov process with killing. So the idea here is that um, we're going to simulate our Markov process with killing sort of forward in time and providing it stays alive, that the sample we have at any time t will be a sample from the corresponding distribution ut. And it turns out that simulating forward this discrete time Markov process with killing is straightforward because all we would need to do is well, initially to simulate from the initial distribution of the process. And then for each time point, we just need to iterate the two, the two points on the slide. Okay, so first of all, we'd sort of um, simulate a transition uh, where we want to go, at, where we want to be at time t, given where we are at time t minus one. Okay, and then we'd need to simulate whether or not the process dies or survives, okay? And the first of these we do just by simulating from the, the transition kernel of the Markov process. And the second of these we just do just by simulating using the, the killing prob probability of our process. Okay, 
So you can hopefully see that, it, you know, just, just forward simulating these processes is it, it, straightforward. Okay. And so th this is quite a simple way of simulating from UT, but it turns out to be um, very inefficient, particularly if, we, if the burn-in time is quite large. Okay, so, so to show that, I have a, a simple example, um, which I'm going to use. Um, and th th so this is going to simulate a, a univariate Markov process with killing. Um, this process is defined to have the startup value two, and then the Markov kernel for the process is that the value of the process at time t, we get just by taking the value of the process at time t minus one and adding a sort of standard normal perturbation. Okay, so it's a, so it's a bit like a sort of simple random walk process. And then we're going to have a killing probability, which is as given in, in, on the slide, k of x. And the idea of this killing probability is that if our current state was zero, so the process was at the origin, then the killing probability would be zero. But as we move away from the origin, the killing probability increases. Okay. So as you'll see in a, a moment, sort of what you'd the way you'd expect this process to behave is that you'd have this random walk component which allows it to sort of jitter about and will at various time points allow it to make sort of excursions quite a long way from the origin but then the killing process will mean that when it starts to move away from the origin it's much more likely to be killed okay uh, and the, the reason i mean this is a very simple um, process and it's actually an example of a, a process where you can analytically calculate what new t is and what the quasi stationary distribution is Okay, and, it, and perhaps it wouldn't be surprising that the quasi station distribution here is just some, some normal distribution. Okay, and one of the nice things of working with a, an example which is tractable is that we can actually look and see how long a burn in would we need to actually get convergence to quasi stationarity. And it turns out that simulating this process forward for 10 time steps would, would mean that we. That U T at time ten is essentially indistinguishable from it, from the quasi stationary distribution of the process. So, so T is ten is an appropriate burn in for this process. And so what I've got here is just a picture of what happens if we sort of sim do the forward simulation of the process. And initially, we just have a slide which just has five realizations of the forward simulation of this process. So each of these realizations corresponds to a line on the plot, and the sort of darker bit of a line corresponds to the period where the process was alive, and then the sort of gray bit at the end of each of the lines corresponds to the sort of final step of the process at which the process died. Okay, and so if I run, so that there should be a movie which will just show. Um, what happens if we just do lots of simulations and you'll see that we'll get more and more of these lines as we do more and more simulations. And you can sort of see the behavior, the intuitive behavior that I described before that the killing probability gets larger as you move away from the origin. So if you look at the realizations that tend to sort of move away from the origin quickly, they tend to die out quickly. Okay. But in terms of, of what we're interested in, which is using this sort of simulation to simulate from the quasi stationary distribution, we can see that this sort of approach isn't very efficient because most of the realizations, so I think, so, so I think this, this figure shows about 500 realizations or 500 forward simulations from our model. Only about five or six of the real, realizations are still alive at time 10. And most of those actually die soon after time 10. You know, so if we'd have used this to simulate from the quasi stationary distribution, we've done an awful lot of simulation, but most of that simulation would have to throw away because we'd only keep the, the states which are alive at time 10 or later. And so we've done a lot of simulation for very few samples from the quasi stationary distribution. Okay. So for so the naive simulation that I've just shown, is easy to do, but it's inefficient. And 
one way of thinking about why it's inefficient is because each time we, we do the forward simulation and the process dies, we have to go back to time zero and start again from time zero. Okay. So it's turned out there's been quite a lot of work looking at better ways of simulating from quasi-station distributions. And most of them are based on what could be thought of as sort of rebirth ideas. We sort of say that when you simulate forward in time and your process dies, rather than going back to the start, you want to only go back, you want anyone to go back to the recent history of the process and replace the dead state by a sort of recently simulated state in, in the recent history of the process. Okay. And, and there's various ways of doing that, but within the scale algorithm in the paper, we actually use one which is based on sequential Monte Carlo ideas. Okay. And it, it, it may not actually be, be the best, but, but it, it's quite a natural um, approach to try. So how, how does a sort of sequential Monte Carlo um, version work? Well, the idea of, of this uh, sequential Monte Carlo algorithm is that we're going to choose some, some number of particles n, and then what we're going to try and do is generate a sample of size n, or a sample of n particles from mu1, and then once we've done that, simulate a sample of n particles from mu2, and, the, and once we've done that, simulate a sample of n particles from mu3, and so on, uh, and do that sort of sequentially over time, and then eventually we'll get, in our case, to mu10, and once we've got, to, got our n particles from mu10, we'll keep them as draws from our quasi-stationary distribution, and we can then propagate further, and all the samples we have at future times would keep the samples from our quasi-stationary distribution. And the simplest way of doing sequential Monte Carlo is just a sort of rejection sampling approach which says, assume I have my n particles or my n samples from mu at t minus one. What I'm going to do is just repeat steps one, two, and three on this slide, which is I'm going to choose one of the particles at time t minus one, uh, random. I'm then going to propagate that using my probability kernel of my Markov chain at time t. And once I've done that, I'm going to simulate whether or not it dies or stays alive using the killing pro probability. Okay. If it stays alive, I'm going to add that to my sample at time t. And if it dies, I'm going to throw it away. Okay. And then I'm just going to repeat steps one and two until I end up having accepted n particles or n samples at time t. Okay. And that gives me a way of given a sample from mu t minus one of producing a sample from, from, from mu t, and I can just repeat that over multiple um, time steps to get, get my samples at, at different time points. Okay. And again, I have a sort of simulation which tries to show what's sort of happening in this case. So this is just a picture for what would happen at step one. So the initial distribution of my process was that it started at, uh, with a value of, of two. And so the, the initial step of my algorithm would just be to simulate a value of the process at time one, conditional on it, the, the value at time zero being two. And then for each of those, simulate whether or not the process stays alive. And I've shown all the simulations on this picture. And then the sort of black lines are supposed to show um, simulations where the particle remained alive and the sort of light gray lines are supposed to show the simulations where the particle died, okay? And then I just keep all the sort of alive particles at time one and I just repeat it um, to be used to propagate from time one to time two, time two to time three, and so on. And as you can see, what this gives me is it gives me a, a set of samples at each time point from the corresponding, or at least up to some Monte Carlo error, um, an approximation to mu t at the different time points. Okay. And then what I can do is I can say, well, burn in, I've chosen a burn in of time 10, so I can throw away all the samples I have at time nine and earlier and keep all the samples I have at time 10 and later as draws from my quasi stationary distribution. Okay. And, and that's the sort of the idea of the sort of sequential Monte Carlo algorithm that, that appears in the paper itself. I'll buy it um, applied to the slightly more complicated setting of, of 
diffusions was killing. There's one other thing I, I should just mention if I go back to the algorithm I showed. So the algorithm I showed is like a rejection sampling approach for propagating particles from time t minus one to time t. Now, if you're familiar with sequential Monte Carlo and, and with re rejection sampling, um, you'll probably guess um, that what you can actually do to improve the efficiency of this algorithm is replace the rejection sampling um, algorithm that I've described here with a, a sort of an equivalent important sampling version. And the idea of that is that rather than simulating whether a, a particle at time t is alive or death, dead, you give it a weight which is proportional to the probability that it, that it is alive. Okay? And it turns out that for, for these sorts of um, problems where you're simulating from a quasi-stationary distribution, using the important sampling version actually can be often much, much more efficient and have much better um, properties than using the rejection sampling version. But, you know, at an intuitive level, they're very similar, but in practice, the important sampling version, which is, I think, the, the main one we give in the paper, turns out to be more efficient. Okay. So the, the final thing I wanted to do is just talk just have two slides giving a bit of the intuition as to why this sort of idea may be um, suitable for big data applications. Um, and I think that's important because um, if you follow what I've said so far, then um, it's quite natural to think, well, okay, you propose this alternative to MCMC where instead of simulating from a stationary distribution, you're simulating from a quasi-stationary distribution but it looks like simulating from a quasi-stationary distribution is much more challenging than simulating from a stationary distribution. So why, why should I bother with this quasi-stationary MCM Monte Carlo idea? Okay. And the reason, well, one of the reasons why I think this quasi-stationary Monte Carlo idea has promise is it has the following property, which makes it quite suitable or quite scalable to, to big data problems. Okay. And the property is the following. So, so if in the algorithm that I described, the killing probability happened to be an average of M separate killing probabilities, so that the true killing probability K is just this average of these Ki um, of X values, okay? Then it turns out that there's a much more efficient way of simulating the killed Markov process forward in time exactly. Okay, and that is the step where we decide whether or not the process survives, which was described as we simulate the process surviving with probability one minus the killing probability. We can replace it with this different step here, which says just choose at random one of the terms in the sum and then use, and call that M, and then use that M killing probability to determine whether or not the process survives or not, okay? And clearly, the second approach is much more efficient because we just need to look at one of the killing probabilities rather than all capital M of them. But it, what's really nice is that the, the process that you're simulating using this much more efficient step is identical to the process you're simulating using this computationally much more expensive step. So you get this sort of this ability to reduce the cost per iteration by a factor, in this case of capital M, whilst introducing no approximation error, you're still simulating from exactly the same process. Okay? And this is relevant in the sort of big data setting because the killing probabilities that appear in the scale algorithm involve sums over um, terms which depend on different data points. So what this means is you can still sort of simulate everything exactly um, but rather than having to look at the whole, um, all the data in order to calculate the sort of what's the equivalent of the killing probability, you can only look over a very small subset of the data to calculate the killing probability and, it, and it's still doing the correct thing. Okay. So that's all I had to say on the topic of um, quasi-stationarity, or the, to introduce the, the idea of quasi-stationarity.
And now I think the idea is that we'll we'll pass over to Murray, who will talk about the sort of um, the the diffusion part uh, of the paper. And just while we handle that transition, uh, you have a chance now to ask some questions if you'd like to uh, for Paul. Uh, if you could type in the the meeting chat, which is the, the the little bubble with some text in that you see, we'll show you the the chat. And you can type a message in there. So if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please type something there. Looks like no takers for the moment. In which right. case, uh, over to Murray. Thank you, Paul and Paul. Um, so I, my talk or my demo talk, I believe it's called, um, I, I'll also be talking around some of the aspects of the paper we're discussing later. So the aspect I'm going to really be talking about is this notion of uh, killed Brownian motion or, or diffusions underpinning the, the methodology we've, we're going to be introducing later. So typically when I present this material and diffusions come up, I can see the audience and usually the audience has eyes which are glazing over because essentially it introduces what looks to be on the surface a lot of complication that's perhaps unnecessary. And so when talking about diffusions, I guess the key question is, why do we even bother with them within the, the QSMC and scale paper? And so I want to try and motivate that. And I want to try and motivate some of the techniques for simulating the diffusions which underpin it. And here are some diffusion sample paths if you've never seen them before. So we're looking a lot in continuous time. I guess the question is, why are we looking in continuous time and why are we considering diffusions at all? So the diffusion that comes up throughout the paper is what we call the Langevin diffusion. I mean, it's a studied object. And basically, this SDE describes its instantaneous behavior. So we can think about it as a stochastic process that evolves according to some drift component with a Brownian motion-like perturbation. And what you'll see is it uses information about pi, which is going to be our target distribution in the Bayesian setting. And it also has this term lambda here, which I won't go into detail about, but it's essentially a, a preconditioning matrix, if you're more familiar with MCMC. Now, this diffusion has a very nice property. So, and in an analogous way to MCMC having an invariant distribution which targets pi, and that motivates using MCMC output to simulate from pi, if I were able to simulate from this diffusion, I have the same sort of notion. It has an invariant distribution pi, and so if I were able to simulate from a trajectory of this diffusion, I could use the output to uh, as a proxy for pi. I could use it for... Um, functionals that I'm interested in. Now, in the particular setting we're looking at within the paper, we've got this big data setting, as we call it. And so if our posterior has this form, where Fi are individual contribution to the likelihood of individual data points and ends very large, then the nice thing about working in continuous time, in particular with diffusions, is the term which dictates how the diffusion moves, this drift term, is linear in data size. So, so the, the, the contribution grad log pi, I've got a linear term where each one of the, the data points contributes linearly to the computational grad log pi. And this is opposed to something like MCMC, which would look at acceptance probabilities if we're working with Metropolis Hastings, for instance, which has this type of product form. And as Paul mentioned towards the end of his talk, the nice thing about having this linear grad log pi in data size is it's very easy to construct unbiased estimators. The construction of an unbiased estimator, what you can do is you can simply choose uniformly at random one of the data points and use that for your estimator. Okay. So hopefully you get an idea of 
why it's useful to be able to simulate diffusions. You get this really nice linear property in terms of evaluations of pi. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how you might simulate a diffusion, which is a concept that a lot of people are not familiar with. And so it's worth spending a little bit of time on. So if we think about this setting where we have the Langevin diffusion, one thing it would be very natural to do is to try and simulate a trajectory of it for some large T. Now, essentially, what I'm going to talk about in this talk is where the drift term is alpha xt. So remember, just keep at the back of your mind, it's this more complicated object. And I'm going to remove the, the preconditioning matrix lambda. And I'm going to focus in single dimension. So the question is, is it possible to simulate a trajectory of this Langevin diffusion. The idea being, if I was able to do that, I could use it within a Monte Carlo scheme. So there are essentially a few key problems with this notion of simulating from it directly. The first one is the paths themselves are continuous. And so it's an infinite dimensional object. So you've got obvious problems of how do you simulate an infinite dimensional object? How do you store it, for instance? The second problem is for all but very simple diffusions or simple target distributions in our case, the transition density is not going to typically have a nice form that you can simulate from directly. So the way I'm going to introduce how you might be able to simulate from it is in various stages. So the first stage is what is directly possible? And the obvious thing which is directly possible is Brownian motion. So if you sit down at a computer and think about simulating Brownian motion, of course, you can never quite get around this problem of simulating in, it, in its entirety this continuous object. The best you can ever really achieve is simulating a finite collection of points. So if I was to initialize my Brownian motion at this black star, I might specify in advance a collection of times that I'm interested in simulating this Brownian motion at. And as a lot of people will cover in their undergraduate, you can simulate from a trajectory of Brownian motion at this finite realization of times by simply simulating a series of Gaussian perturbations. Right? So what you might end up with is a realization which looks like this. Now, the nice property of Brownian motion is, although I'm only ever simulating a finite collection of points, if I think about any time marginal that I have simulated, it's exact. And furthermore, if I wanted to simulate it at any other point, suppose the point given by this red vertical line, I can also simulate that exactly, so without any approximation error. And that's simply a property of Brownian motions. The, the, the intermediary point has a, a closed form that we can simulate from. And so Brownian motion has a notion which I'm calling here sufficiency, or it can have a skeletal-like structure, in that even though you can never simulate it in its entirety, you can simulate enough of it, okay? Now, what can you do in more generality? Well, there are obviously a lot of approaches out there people will be more familiar with based around approximation. But we really want to avoid approximation when we're in this Monte Carlo setting, diffusions for Monte Carlo setting. And the approximation means you don't simulate directly from pi. So we're interested specifically in exact approaches. And one promising approach is essentially rejection sampling, rejection sampling. It has a few different names. It's also called exact algorithms, path space rejection sampling, and it, it dates back a little bit now. So I guess the question is, what, what do we even mean by rejection sampling on path space? And we still have to be realistic. We're never going to be able to simulate the path in its entirety. And so the best we can ever hope for is this sufficiency setting where we simulate enough of it that if we want to simulate it further, we can. Okay. 
So given this is a demo, it's probably worth revisiting briefly rejection sampling, not for diffusions, but for densities. So this is an illustration to show you what's going on. Essentially, if I was wanting to simulate from pi, which is the density given by this, this nasty blue curve, then what I do with rejection sampling is I find some other proposal density Q, which a multiple of can bound pi. And what I'm really doing is I'm simulating uniformly under this curve Q times M. And if it lies in the blue, I accept it. Otherwise, I reject it. Or the other way of thinking about it, marginalizing over this uniform simulation, I can accept it with some probability if X is simulated according to Q, or I can reject it with some probability if X is simulated according to Q. So algorithmically, this is what it looks like. OK, so laboring the point slightly, I'm simulating in step one some proposal. I simulate a uniform random variable. This is going to help me with the accept reject. I have some coin PQ that I'm going to flip. Form of the coin looks like this. And if it comes up heads or if used less than or equal to this quantity, I accept. Otherwise, I reject. Now, conditional on acceptance, I have a draw from the target density that I'm interested in, pi. So there's some important features in this setting. We want Q to be tractable or easy in the sense that I can simulate from it. I need some relationship between the supports of pi and Q. Everywhere there's mass under pi, I've also got mass under Q. And I need to be able to compute this rejection bound, or rejection constant. So what does rejection sampling for diffusions look like? Well, it's not really that much more complicated. So essentially what it looks like is rather than simulating from a proposal density, I'm going to simulate a path from some other measure. So that'd be an entire trajectory between zero and T. And the obvious thing to choose would be Brownian motion. So this is X simulated according to W is an entire trajectory of Brownian motion. Just as before, I'm going to simulate my uniform random variable to help me decide whether to accept or reject. And there's a direct analog of this pointwise evaluation of the densities for determining the coin. And that's essentially saying, how likely is X generated from W having been realized from Q? Same as before, after you flip this coin or you compute this quantity and determine its relationship with U, you would either accept or reject. The complication isn't the, philosoph the philosophy of the algorithm, really it's the practical implementation. So there's a couple of bottlenecks to practically implementing this algorithm. The first really is that in step one, we're still simulating this continuous time stochastic process. We're simulating an entire Brownian motion sample path, and that's going to be infinite dimensional. And the second complication really is computing this coin. You know, what is it? What is M? And so you've got to specify these quantities. So this is the worst slide in the presentation, in case you're not asleep already. So what, what does this coin look like? Well, the coin has a form which to proportionality looks like this term here. And you can decompose the coin into two terms. The first term is only a function of the end point. And the idea is you can correct this first term or you can get rid of this first term by simply modifying your Brownian motion simulation by biasing the end point suitably. And that gets rid of this first term here. The second term you can think about you know, as an acceptance probability or the term in the coin that's really going to cause problems. And this is a functional of the entire sample path. So you'll notice we've got an integral here. Now, the key observation really is this term here is coincides with the probability a Poisson process of rate phi, you know, alpha squared plus alpha prime over two, 
on the interval zero t has precisely zero events. And so the idea is, although we can't compute this quantity, because it requires a full evaluation of the path, we can instead simulate a Poisson process with that intensity. And if it has zero events, accept or reject. And so the key idea really is thinking about the simulation of this entire path that we originally had the problem with, the proposal. The key idea really is we're not going to simulate the whole path. We're only going to simulate the parts of the path that we need in order to determine whether this auxiliary Poisson process gives us a head or a tail. And this is what this statement is saying. OK, so that's the worst slide in the talk. So we're going to revisit the algorithm. We're going to motivate what can happen algorithmically. So you'll recall this is the, the, the basic path space rejection sampler I introduced, the exact algorithm. As before, step one, we make a proposal according to Brownian motion. We simulate a uniform random variable, which we use to determine acceptance or rejection or a coin. And then conditional on acceptance, we have a path from what from what we desire, our target distribution or our target measure. So what we're going to do is go from this to a practical algorithm in a number of stages. So the first thing we're going to discuss is I mentioned that we should bias the end point, right? We should modify the end point to account for this nasty first term in, in our coin or original coin. So rather than simulating from Brownian motion, what we're going to simulate from is Brownian motion, but where the end point has been skewed or biased by according to some density. And just like in rejection sampling, if we change the proposal density, of course, that's going to change our coin. So it's no longer PW, it's going to be PZ. And PZ is basically PW without that nasty term. Otherwise, the algorithm is identical. Now, what next? Well, we're going to think about how do we simulate this trajectory of Z from the measure Z? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to break it into lots of steps. So what could you do? Well, you could think about simulating the endpoint, first of all. You could think about simulating what collection of times given by this auxiliary Poisson process are you interested in? And simulating the path at that finite collection of times. Now remember, because I've already simulated the endpoint, I need to condition on that as well. And then finally, I could think about filling in the rest of the path. So if I think about steps one through four, really it's a, an elaborate way of simulating a single trajectory from Z. Still not possible because it requires the whole path. Now, the next thing to, to talk about really is step three. So in step three just now, we need to flip a coin which we can't compute, or we need to compare U to a, a quantity which we can't compute directly. But the key thing is, because I can construct an unbiased estimator, which only requires a finite amount of the path, I can replace step three with this unbiased estimator. Now, this is quite a trick. Because actually, what you end up with is an algorithm which is identical to the original algorithm, but doesn't require an acceptance computation leading the whole path. You only need part of the path. So it's a very extreme example of an unbiased estimator giving you an algorithm which is statistically identical, but far more feasible. Now, the thing to observe here is Really, this algorithm is still not possible to implement in practice because of step 1.4. I still need to simulate the whole path in step 1.4. But the key observation is now, actually, I don't need to simulate step 1.4 at step 1.4. I can think about reordering the steps of the algorithm in such a way to make the algorithm practical. So how can I make it practical? Well, now that the acceptance probability step three doesn't depend on the whole path, I can think about simulating the whole path after determining whether or not to accept or reject it. 
So I can first of all decide whether to accept or reject it. And then I can simulate the other parts of the path I'm interested in when I'm interested in them. Okay, so really that's the, the pedagogy going from rejection sampling for densities to trying to get something practical for diffusions. Now there's a, a key remark here which I, I have glossed over and essentially it relates to the simulation of this auxiliary Poisson process. So the auxiliary Poisson process is of rate, inhomogeneous rate, phi. Now, in order to practically simulate a Poisson process of that rate, we require bounds. And in order to find bounds which are suitable, what we do is we, instead of simulating Brownian motion in the traditional sense, where I just simulate from its transition density, I simulate instead from constrained Brownian motion or localised Brownian motions, it has a few different names, and this is essentially Brownian motion simulated together with information about intervals in which it's constrained. So what does that look like? So it might, for instance, look like this. So what would the output of the algorithm be? So the output of the algorithm would be essentially these hatched boxes. This tells me intervals of space and time in which the path is constrained. And then values of the path at specific times given by these black stars. Now, the blue and the red lines here are trying to convey this notion that although we don't know the entire sample path, we can't simulate the whole sample path, there is some underlying sample path which I can look at in more detail if I want. So the output of the exact algorithms, path space rejection samplers, are these what we call skeletons, which are collections of intervals for which the path is constrained, plus times where we know the actual location of the path. Now, the nice thing about this type of simulation is it has this notion of sufficiency. So if I knew the path at a collection of points and had layer information, the constraints for which the Brownian motion is contained at various times, I can basically resolve this to any accuracy I want at any collection of times that I want. And how's this done? Well, it is a bit of a detail, and a lot of the details are in the paper or, or, or referenced in the paper in the appendixes, which are very long. Essentially, the idea is if we know the path at two points, two endpoints given by x at time s and y at time t, and information about the extent of the path within that interval, then what you can do is you can think about dividing that into or bisecting it into smaller intervals with resolved layer information. And the details are in the paper. They're a bit detailed. And what you get out is a thing that looks like this. OK, so that's the simulation of diffusions using rejection sampling. I think it's worth relating this to or relating it directly or at least the intuitive level of what's in the paper. So this is towards QSMC in scale. So if you recall the original motivation, why we were looking at these continuous time um, diffusions, well, we were hoping to exploit its potential for big data. We're hoping to exploit them within a Monte Carlo scheme. And the Monte Carlo scheme would be simulating a trajectory of the Langevin diffusion, which is at the top here again, and then using the output of that trajectory as a proxy for pi, so Monte Carlo sampler for pi. So I guess the question to ask is, can you use directly this notion of rejection sampling for diffusions to sample from the Langevin diffusion and the answer is no, which may beg the question, why did we just go through all of these slides? Um, the answer is no, but it's no for an interesting reason. So the interesting reason is essentially this, this rejection sampler is a way of simulating from the transition density of the Langevin diffusion. And if you recall the essence of the algorithm, it had two parts. You simulated an endpoint which was this biased endpoint that came from what we call biased Brownian motion. And then we flipped a coin. 
we flip this PZ coin. Now, the interesting thing is in the particular case of the Laundrevin diffusion, this biasing term, this first step of the algorithm simulating from the end point, is equivalent to simulating from pi to the half. Now, remember, pi is our target distribution. And if I had access to pi to the half, it's not clear why I'd be using it or, or to pi itself. It's not clear why I would want to develop a Monte Carlo algorithm to sample from pi. And so, in principle, you could apply rejection sampling to simulate from Langevin diffusion, but you stumble across this fact that you've got to be able to simulate from pi to the half. Now, it's an interesting remark. Though, although we can't simulate directly from the Langevin diffusion, which is unconditioned, it doesn't have an endpoint, we can simulate from Langevin diffusion bridges. So a Langevin diffusion bridge is basically where you tie the endpoint, you have a specified location where the, the endpoint is going to be. It's a bridge because you're connecting two points in time and space. And it's possible to use rejection sampling techniques to simulate from the diffusion bridges. So this is sort of an intriguing result, and it's not entirely clear why that helps you towards QSMC and ultimately scale. But here's perhaps the connecting intuition. Now, throughout the paper, we in various points talk about what we call the double Langevin diffusion, which is a term we've made up and so it's perhaps slightly confusing. What we mean by the double Langevin diffusion is essentially we multiply the drift term by a factor of two. Now, how does that change its invariant distribution? Well, it still has an invariant distribution, which I guess is important, but rather than targeting pi, it now targets pi squared. Okay, so if you double the drift for the Langevin diffusion, you could in principle try and use rejection sampling techniques to simulate from a trajectory of that. Instead, you'd be getting a draw from pi squared. Or another way to think about it is if we think about this notion of the transition density again, it would be a two-stage rejection sampler with a bias proposal. The bias is going to be slightly different to take account of the different drift and a coin. The coin is going to be different to take account of the drift. But together, as t gets large, we'd be targeting pi squared. Now, what is h in this setting? Well, h in this setting is pi. So now we've got an algorithm where, in principle, we could get draws from pi squared had we already got draws from pi. And this is quite an intriguing notion. So the argument you might posit is, well, Suppose I were to just neglect simulating from H entirely. Well, if I was to neglect simulating from H entirely, then I would expect to influence the target distribution by a factor something like 1 over pi. And so the question and the original formulation of QSMC or intuition for why QSMC might work when we started the paper was if we think about rejection sampling for the double Langevin diffusion, where we remove or neglect the biasing of the endpoint, then perhaps we get something as its invariant distribution. It's not going to be an invariant distribution when we formulate it in QSMC, but this notion of an invariant distribution, which looks like pi squared over pi, which of course is pi. And indeed, if you think about that methodology for QSMC in terms of a rejection sampler where you've neglected the first term, methodologically you arrive at QSMC. And that's essentially what I wanted to cover. Obviously, this is intuition and it's not a formal result. We, we covered the formal results in the, the main presentation. But it, hopefully that gives people some intuition on what's going on. That's me, Paul. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, my my um, machine froze just as you were finishing. <laughs> uh, great. 
That's all very helpful. Thank you. Uh, now it's the time to ask questions either of Murray uh, or of Paul, if you thought of some questions for him. If you'd like to ask a question, please type me a message in the chat. Just remains really for me to, to thank Paul and Murray very much for that uh, introduction, uh, which I think will be extremely helpful for um, uh, the, the main paper that's coming along later. Um, so if you'd like to go away and grab yourselves a cup of tea uh, or whatever, um, the real meeting, the so I shouldn't say that. The, the discussion meeting proper uh, will start at five o'clock, which is in just under half an hour's time. And we'll look forward to seeing all of you there. You're very welcome to, to log out and then log back in using the same link again if you want to in the meanwhile. Um, uh, we've tried applause before on these things and it doesn't work very well, but I'll, I'll just sort of mind doing some because that was a very nice introduction. Thank you very much.